We know not when the master of the house comes, at even or at midnight, or at the cock crowing, or in the morning. Welcome to this episode of The Soul Trap. My name is Joel Tillis, and we trust that wherever, whenever this broadcast finds you, it finds you in good health, good spirits, and as we always say on that good and narrow way, we have a very exciting show for you today. We are going to be talking with the author of the book called The Time of the End, The 10-Year Tribulation Period, and The Conditional Rapture of Tribulation Saints. That is is a great title. It is Matthew Crane. He is the founder of Final Fight Bible Radio. He's written another great book. We're going to come back and interview him again on Eden's fate. What is the Garden of Eden? Where is it? And what happened to it? So that is going to be another great interview that we do with him down the road. But for right now, I want to encourage you to make sure that you get this book. I read this book twice. I'm working on it. Uh, even as we speak right now, it is a tremendous book. And even if you walk away, maybe not agreeing with everything, it's going to challenge your thinking, challenge your Bible study. And most of all, it's going to excite you as a believer about Jesus Christ coming again. I am glad and honored to have Matt Crane with us on the show. He's been a longtime friend of the Soul Trap and a personal friend. We count him a personal friend. Brother Matt, we are glad to have you. And uh, we thank you for taking the time for being with, being with us today. Well, thanks. It's an honor and a privilege to once again be on the Soul Trap. So I appreciate that. Well, we're honored to have you and we're excited. So here's the thing, gang. We are nearing, uh, I believe, the time, the crescendo of all that has been prophesied and talked about. Uh, I believe we are getting closer and closer and closer to seeing some the close of what we as Bible believers would call the dispensation of the church, the body of Christ. I think we're getting ready to see that wrap up. And because we're nearing the end of that dispensation, I believe we're seeing on the horizon the preparatory events that are necessary for the next dispensation to come. One of the things that we know that's going to happen, according to the Apostle Paul, specifically in 2 Timothy chapter number 3, is that there will be perilous times, but there will be great deception. And I'm not just talking about deception about wear two masks, wear one, don't wear this, don't do that. I'm talking about deception within the church itself. The vast majority of mainstream Christianity has been stripped of a Bible. They've been stripped of final authority. And when it comes to prophecy, about as deep as they go is the Tim LaHaye, uh, blink of an eye, we're all gone, no bad things happen to us. That's the rapture. And that is so far away from what the truth is. And it has caused great confusion. But I think that there's another thing that has happened. And I want to say specifically among my crowd, my stripe, that I would call Bible believers, or even just you know fundamental solid Christians, and that is that we tend to get locked into, sometimes we're so hard on defending what we believe, that we lock ourselves out, not to new truth, but to truth that has not yet been discovered. And when somebody comes along and says, hey, not that I have found something quote-unquote new in the Bible, but I see through illumination truth that, that has not yet been discovered, and they begin to present that, our immediate reaction is, You're, leave me alone. I like where I am. I believe in the old book. I believe in the old truths. I'm a dispensationalist, and, and on and on, and I'm with you. I agree. But the Bible says, let God be true and every man a liar. In other words, we always exalt the Word of God. Do we exalt the Word of God above Joel Osteen? Absolutely. Do we exalt the Word of God above the soul trap? or Final Fight Bible Radio, absolutely. And we also exalt it above those heroes that we love so much. Clarence Larkin, uh, B.H. Carroll, Dr. Peter Ruckman, even those men, everybody has to kneel before the Word of God. And as I begin to read Brother Matt Crane's book on the time of the end, I had to catch myself. My initial reaction was, no, 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 leave my dispensationalism alone. <laughs> and I, I had to stop. I went, I can remember specifically, it was late at night, I was reading it, Brother Matt. I actually stopped, put the book down, went and made some tea. And I thought, you know what? He's not messing up 
my church doctrine and dispensation, he's actually unfolding it even more. It's like a rose in my mind. I begin to think of like a rose or a flower that has bloomed open. And all you did was bring, I think, a little bit more sunshine and has allowed it to just open up even more. I don't know if that's an apropos illustration, but that's kind of what I felt like. And that's what kept me from going off the deep end and calling you a heretic. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> right. So without further ado, gang, we're going to jump in. And I think it's absolutely important because we need this doctrine more than ever. So let me tell you what, what a traditional is. And then you tell me, Matt, in a, in a brief overview, what it is. And then once we get the brief overview, then we're going to dive off into the deep. Here's what, what I believe is a classic dispensationalist. Um, I believe that the church age is a distinct time period that God has worked through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that at any moment, without signs, without wonders, there is a rapture of the body of Christ. That the Lord Jesus Christ will descend to the clouds of the air, the voice of the archangel, the trump of God. Dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be called up together. Now, I don't believe that that excludes the church from any kind of small t tribulation. In fact, I believe we're going to go through a tremendous amount of tribulation. What that looks like, we can talk about maybe the tribulation is horrific. Maybe it's the tribulation of dealing with prosperity. That's something that we'll talk about down the road. But I believe that, that when that happens, the church will be removed. And the traditional view is that Daniel's 70th week, which has been on hold, will that clock will begin to start ticking again, especially when the man of sin is revealed, the rider on the white horse. And the traditional Larkian position, Clarence Larkin position, is that seven years tribulation will begin. How long that happens after the rapture is something we'll get into. But there's a seven year distinct period known as Jacob's trouble. Three and a half years tribulation, and then when the Antichrist goes into the temple, the abomination of desolation, that starts the great tribulation. At the end of the great tribulation is where the return of Christ is. And then he begins the actual revelation, the return sets up his millennial rule. And off we go, we can talk about that down the road. So I have just painted with a real quick, big, broad stroke that but I think just about Every Ruckmanite, every dispensationalist that's a, that's a Bible believer would s understand exactly what I'm just describing there. Now, you come along and you don't do any injustice to the body of Christ, but you address a couple things. And one of the challenges that you seem to address is the clear struggle that has been there over time periods. How do you fit certain things together? And then the whole Matthew 24, this past week, I just counseled with somebody who said, well, I see the rapture in Matthew chapter 24. And I had to address that because, you know, they're, they're looking at, well, that's a rapture. <laughs> and it's a yes, but it's not Paul's rapture. So I gave you a broad overview. They're tired of hearing me now. In essence, with this book, tell me what the big picture is, and then I'll come in and start diving in, and we'll, we'll take a look at, at the details of what you're saying. All right. Yeah, sure. Well, just for a real quick uh, background, I personally have been saved for over 25 years. Just right when I got saved, I was really interested in the Bible and studying the Bible. And so I ended up going to Bible school. Long story, but I ended up having uh, five years of formal Bible education for what it's worth. Uh, I've been in an official capacity in the ministry for about 11 years now. And basically uh, about 10 years ago, well, even when I was in Bible school, I started to see some things that I started to wonder about in terms of this theory. And when I ended up moving to Oregon and was an associate pastor, I was asked to teach adult Sunday school and, and decided to do a whole series on the end times. And it wasn't until then that I started going through and trying to come up with a chronological layout of these events in the book of Revelation that I began to really see some discrepancies and some contradictions in our currently accepted teachings. And um, because we have a lot of things, a lot of ideas about the end times, and we just kind of jumble it together. But as a teacher, when you're trying to explain a subject to people, uh, you have to go even deeper and, and find the nuances and the details of these things. And so what I found was as I was going through that study, 
I, I began to discover that there's a lot of things that we just kind of take for granted. We just kind of assume that we don't really have necessarily proof for. And you had mentioned that I, you know, there's some new things in this book and things like that. I, I personally, I, I don't set out to find new things. I don't mm -hmm. have to be the guy that finds the new things. That's not what, when I read my Bible, I'm not looking for that. But what I have, what has happened is I am looking for uh, uh, consistency in the word of God. And when there's inconsistencies in theories, regardless of whose theories it is, whether it's a Mormon theory, a Catholic theory, a JW theory, if, if there's an inconsistency and we're saying that this is the word of God, then we need to solve the inconsistency because we have, I believe we have a perfect Bible. All right. So <clears throat> it was finding the inconsistencies and so many of them that made me start to think I need to, we need to just, I need to go back to the drawing board, start over and retrace the steps of our biblical forefathers and find out, you know, where they went off on these trails and see if we've out, wound, wound up in the right direction. So essentially mm -hmm. that's what I did. And that's how I came up uh, with what I found in this book. I, uh, the, the traditional theory, as you've uh, mentioned, is that, you know, there's going to be the church rapture, which is what a lot of people are interested in these days. A lot of people are under the impression with everything going on in the world that we're in the last, last days. I would agree that we're in the last days, but there's a, a large portion of Christians that are under the impression that we're actually in the tribulation period right now. Right, um, right. So these things need to be understood by Christians, and it's important to know these things. And so there's there's the rapture, and, the general. I mean, I say that that I mean, I say that that is is growing larger. We're seeing more and more of what we would call our stripe jump ship and say, no, 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 we are in the tribulation. We are going through the tribulation and that kind of thing. So mm -hmm. I, I just want to say, I think this is a vital doctrine that we're dealing with. I don't think that this is just speculative fun. I think this has real bearing for a Christian. So I, I didn't mean to interrupt, but yeah. Well, absolutely. And I, and I think part of that that I, I mentioned in the book, part of the reason why a lot of Bible believers are starting to take that position is because there's a lot of references and texts, especially out throughout Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that have not been thoroughly explained by Bible believers of, of, of our dispensational framework. Uh, Matthew 25, mm -hmm. I looked through multiple different uh, Bible-believing commentaries on, an, on a doctrinal explanation of those virgins in Matthew chapter 25, there's nothing out there. Uh, same right. with the passage in Matthew 22 about the servants and bringing in the people, gathering them to visit the wedding. No doctrinal uh -huh. explanation whatsoever. And so when Bible believers start to see, well, wait a second, we don't have the answers, and there's people out there that are saying, well, the answer for this is that there's a rapture in the middle of the tribulation. They mm -hmm. start to see how that can piece together and and consequently, they're moving away from uh, the pre-tribulation rapture position. Now, I am still a pre-tribulation rapture. I still take that pre-tribulation rapture position that the church will have nothing to do whatsoever with any of the end times. Um, uh -huh. but, the, but what I point out is essentially in this book is that the first half of Daniel's 70th week was fulfilled during the ministry of Jesus Christ. There's only three and a half years left to be fulfilled. And the end times doesn't necessarily have to be rapture of the church three and a half years, second advent, but the great tribulation begins with the man of sin standing in the holy place. And then after that moment, there's three and a half years of great tribulation, but the rapture doesn't have to take place the minute the antichrist stands in the holy place. Therefore, uh -huh. there can be an unspecified amount of time in between the rapture of the church and the start of the great tribulation. And mm -hmm. most of the time, the, the typical Clarence Larkin position is that this is three and a half years. I don't take that position. I think there's uh, some, some difficulties with that position. But in the book, I explain what this length of time is. And uh, like, like you said, we can uh, go into the details. As okay, we so let me clarify with what you've got as people are watching. So what you're saying is on the red arrow is the, the rapture of the church. Yes. Okay. And then the blue is, is in essence, the revelation of Christ. Right. So traditionally, what we're looking at in between that time is a traditional dispensational position is that that time period is, is seven years. And the reason we get that seven years is because of Daniel, <clears throat> the teaching of Daniel, and the, the weeks that are actual seven years. The week, one week represents seven years. So you've got the 69 years that have been fulfilled, and then that 70th week of seven years, that 70th week of seven years, 
the traditional classical dispensationalist says that Daniel's 70th week fits right there. So you've got three and a half years, like you said, the man of sin, and then three and a half years. What you're implying, what you're saying, which is not exclusively to you, but what you're saying is, is that that three and a half years of great tribulation, but the first three and a half years of Daniel's 70th week, that, that's not actual post-rapture. That is something that took place when Jesus Christ first came. Right. Yeah, and essentially what, what you get from that, if, if I'll take a second just to read this passage, because really Daniel chapter 9, verses 25 and 26 and 27 is the linchpin of this whole concept. And depending okay. on your interpretation of this passage really affects your layout of uh, prophecy, chronology, and the timeline. Okay, so we're going to put that up on the screen, and uh, we'll put that up there post-production, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but we'll put it up there. What you're talking about and what we're discussing is Daniel chapter 9. The entire context is verses 20 through 27, but you're specifically talking about which which verses? Uh, 25, 26, and 27. Okay, this go right in. This is the prophecy of Daniel's 70 weeks, and, he, and it says, uh, well, verse 24, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people, the Jews, and upon thy holy city, that's Jerusalem, to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Okay, so he's saying basically from now uh, until the return of Jesus Christ, you get your millennial kingdom, the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant, there's 70 weeks. Now we understand, you know, without going into all the details that these are not literal weeks, but each day in each day represents one year. So 70 weeks would be 490 years. Now mm -hmm. we know that when Daniel was given this vision, it's been far more than 490 years have transpired. So what we have here is evidently a number of years have transpired and then the clock stopped and then there's a remainder left to be fulfilled. And that's where we get into verse 25. He says, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem, that was in the days of the Persian kings, unto Messiah the Prince, that's Jesus Christ, shall be weeks and three score and two weeks. Okay, so that's 69 weeks. The street mm -hmm. shall be built again and the wall, even in troublous times. All right, so basically from the time of this vision till the uh, Messiah, till Jesus Christ is going to be 69 weeks. All right, mm -hmm. we have a total of 70, that gives us 69. And then he says in verse 26, and after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and, and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. All right, now bear in mind this is all an angelic uh, prophecy. This angel is giving Daniel this information, and angels are notoriously vague a lot of times uh -huh. when they give uh -huh. prophetic information. If you ever read the book of Zechariah, you know, your audience, it's... Uh, Yes. Like, come yes. on, angels? <laughs> <laughs> a little clarity. A little clarity. That's all we ask. Yeah. But he says, uh, and then in verse 27, it says, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And that's where we get the final week of, of prophecy remaining to be fulfilled. He shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, okay, so three and a half years into this thing, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Now, big words in there, Some your reader, your audience will have to go and just read it for themselves and just kind of digest every aspect of that. But in a nutshell, from Daniel to Messiah the Prince is 69 weeks. Now, the question is, at what point does that 69 weeks take place? Now, some would say, well, it's the birth of Christ. Okay, so he's arrived. Some would say, well, it's the baptism of Christ, because that was when he was actually anointed by the Holy Spirit. Okay. Uh -huh. And then uh, some would say, well, it's the crucifixion. That was the 69 weeks. And the the wording there is interesting because it says after three score and two weeks, and it's including the seven from before. So basically, basically after the 69 weeks, shall Messiah be cut off. If that verse said, at 69 weeks, shall Messiah be cut off, then we could stop Daniel's 70th or 69th week at the cross, and the time stopped, and now, therefore, we have one week left to be fulfilled in the future. 
but it said after that little word after there. So it implies mm -hmm. that uh, the anointing of the Messiah was the baptism of Jesus Christ. Jesus had a three and a half year ministry. And then the, the, uh, that would bring you three and a half years into the 69th week of Daniel or the 70th week of Daniel, however you want to say it. But we're three and a half years into it. At Calvary, the clock stopped. And now there's only three and a half years left to be fulfilled. And then what I take from that is uh, in verse 27, the person that's confirming the covenant for one week. Now, that this verse is the linchpin. If you say that that's the Antichrist, then the, which is the, the traditional theory that most people accept is uh -huh. the Antichrist is going to confirm a covenant with the Jewish people for one week. He's going to have this peace deal with Israel. It's going to be three and a half years of peace. And in the midst of the week, the Antichrist is going to break the deal and then uh, turn against the Jews. And it's going to be great tribulation. That's the general mm -hmm. position. I'm taking for granted that verse 27 is a reference to the Antichrist. But because the, the wording, it says he, it doesn't tell you specifically who it is. And there's two antecedents in the previous verse you could have it be messiah the prince right or it could be the prince of the uh the prince that shall come which is often assumed to be the antichrist so there's two antecedents that could be i started investigating what if this he in verse 27 is jesus what uh -huh. if jesus confirms the abrahamic covenant with the jews and it's, and basically his uh, his baptism when he shows up on the scene he says this day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears the time is at hand uh -huh. So it says, boom, here I am. I'm. This is the final week. I'm confirming the covenant. Three and a half years into it, we know that the Jews rejected Jesus Christ. They crucified him. And uh, basically, Jesus caused the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And Jesus is the one who, uh, who stopped the clock. Basically, he broke, didn't break the covenant, but he caused it to, this covenant to cease. So I'll uh -huh. go ahead and pause there. And uh, in case I've gone too fast or gone over no no no, no no i'll uh, let you in so, well right now we're getting down into it now we're getting down to the nuts and bolts because what you know whether you're looking at it on screen or you study it on your own and if you don't get anything else from this time that we're spending we we want you to study the scripture don't mm -hmm. take joel's word don't take matt's word you study the scripture and seek the truth out but the key there has traditionally been that that antichrist or that he in verse 27 is the antichrist and everything flows from that mm -hmm. now what you're submitting is is that that is actually the antecedent is reaching back up to verse 26 talking about the messiah now Here's where I want to jump into the book a little bit, and, and I don't want, it's not fair for an author to write a book and then for us to make you to read the book to us in, <laughs> in a five-hour interview, but there's a couple of things that jump out that make not just the fact that it's grammatically correct, but when you start looking at, you mentioned something early on, chronologically, chronologically, if this is Jesus and that three and a half years of Daniel's 70th week, the first three and a half years have already been fulfilled, that means there's only three and a half years of, of the end or great tribulation still to come. What that does, in according to your study, is it opens up a time period, as I'm looking at the board, board between the rapture and, and the revelation of the man of sin, and it's, it's a time that you talk about Satan's advent, and you are now able to take a lot of stuff that we've wrestled with. I mean, one of the things Larkin wrestled with was, and, and even expositors have, is it's very hard to get away from the fact that there's going to be a transfer of power somehow back to Babylon, that, that, that all of these, you know, rebuilding. How do you fit the temple and all, how do you fit all of this stuff that's going to happen in three and a half years? And you say, once that first three and a half years is shown to be fulfilled, there's another number that jumps out in our Bible study. And that number is, is 10 that comes up quite a bit. And so when you take that three and a half years and fold it back up under 10, what you've actually got is a seven year period for a lot of this stuff to get set up. Am, am I assessing kind of what you're getting to in the book correctly? How, how would you yeah. say it? Yeah, yeah, that, that's uh, pretty much exactly right. So uh, once you take away, basically Daniel chapter uh, 927 is the proof text, if you will, for a seven year tribulation period. If you 
go with the possibility that the first three and a half years of that 70th week were fulfilled in Jesus's ministry, because nowhere does it say that the seven years are tribulation. That's something right. that we've slapped onto that. Um, if the first three and a half years are Jesus's ministry, then you don't really have a strong argument throughout the rest of the Bible that from the rapture of the church to the second advent is seven years. Now, if it is, that's fine. But what I'm getting at is uh, essentially that um, the first three, the first portion of this time period is called the beginning of sorrows. And the last portion is the is what's remaining to be fulfilled of Daniel's 70th week and starts the time when the Antichrist stands in the holy place. That opens up this time period to be uh, really a lot of different things. Uh, I've heard people say that this is a 40 year time period. Even Clarence Larkin on page 43 of his uh, second coming of Christ, if anybody thinks that I'm completely departing from the accepted position, uh, even Clarence Larkin himself acknowledges that if the tribulation is seven years, because that's what he goes with, he, he acknowledges that there could be a gap between the rapture and the start of that time period. And, right. Okay, so I'm going to read from your page 70. You say this. You say a 10-year time of the end theory allows for a pre-tribulation rapture of the church, which is vital. That, that's an important doctrine. Adequate time for all of the events of the book of Revelation to unfold. And this is interesting, a transitional period between church age and the great tribulation. So one of the things I want to circle back around is once we get out of the mindset that that you're that we're not doing any damage to the the mystery of the rapture of the body of Christ. Once we get that mindset out, what we're actually saying is is that now that rapture which is very clearly taught in Matthew 22, Matthew 24, Matthew 25, but is very clearly not a church rapture. Now that makes sense um, because it, it, there's a lot of things and nuances that go into that, but it makes sense because you, you should be ready for that. Uh, and, and it begins to unfold in its way. So take us down that road just a little bit. Um, yeah. that 10 days and how that elaborates and begins to dovetail into that that Jewish rapture or, or that rapture in there. Absolutely. Yeah. So the, the title is the 10 year tribulation period and the conditional rapture of uh, tribulation saints. And uh, essentially, after I determined or understood or believed that there's only three and a half years left to be fulfilled, the next question is, well, what is the time gap between the rapture of the church and the start of the great tribulation? And what you find uh throughout the Bible continually over and over and over in the context of the last days is the number 10 is shows up all the time. Why is that? Now we know that 10 is the number of the Gentiles, but even this final time period, this is the time, the wrapping up of the times of the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. And this is the time period that the Bible in Daniel chapter two likens to the feet or the toes of the image, which you're dealing with 10 toes. This yeah. is the time period where you're going to show up, where you're going to have 10 horns that are represented as 10 Kings show up in the book of Revelation 17. Uh, you have in Matthew chapter 25, you have this thing about the 10 virgins. Uh, you have this thing about uh, the uh, a number of different tens are showing up throughout the Bible. You've got um, that Job is reproached 10 times, the plagues of Egypt, a type of the end times, a type of the great tribulation period. You got 10 plagues of Egypt. Why this number 10 continually showing up? And then why is it that there's a couple of passages in the New Testament that indicate that somebody gets left behind at a rapture. That's the other big problem. In Matthew chapter 25, you're, Jesus gives a parable of about 10 virgins and five are wise, five are foolish. And when the bridegroom comes and knocks on the door, five are taken away and five are left behind. Mm -hmm. Well, if we're, what is that? A lot of people, if they say, well, that's the church rapture, those are Christians. Okay, well now you're dealing with a problem where some Christians are being left behind, maybe because mm -hmm. they're not living right or because they're not watching and looking for the return of Jesus. Um, so you start getting into problems with your theology when you start dealing with Christians being left behind and then having to go through the tribulation period, potentially right. having to take the mark of the beast. You start getting all kinds of problems. So what I recognize is what if there was another rapture after the rapture of the church? So what if this time period was 10 and a half years? 
specifically, because if you have a rapture in the spring, which I think the church rapture, there's a number of uh, scriptures, Song of Solomon 2, a, a few different places that seem to indicate that the church rapture will correspond to springtime. There's a uh -huh. number of uh, chap uh, verses in the Bible that, that indicate the second advent is going to be around the Feast of Tabernacles in the fall. And I'll point this out really quick for people that are traditional seven-year uh, tribulation believers. Uh, you have some, you're going to have to explain that because if, you're, if you believe in a springtime rapture but a, a fall second advent, then the length of time from the rapture to the second advent is not seven years. It's seven and a half years. And that's uh -huh. important when you're dealing with these prophecies that deal with 1,200 and three score days and time, times, and half a time. So right, that right. has to be explained and understood. But essentially what you have is there is going to be a rapture that is conditional, but it's not the church's rapture. And if you insert a conditional rapture about three and a half, four years into the uh, end times, the beginning of sorrows, that's for Jews— then what you have is is you all of a sudden passages like Matthew chapter 22, Matthew chapter 25, Luke chapter 12, Luke chapter 21, Mark chapter 13. All of these things start to make a whole lot of sense because what you're dealing with is you're dealing with believers post church rapture, who uh, they're 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 saved by by grace through faith. I believe that faith in Jesus Christ is an aspect of that. But the key difference with their salvation versus ours is they are not sealed with the Holy Spirit. Uh -huh. Except for the exception of the 144,000. But any average person that's believing they're preaching at this time, they can trust in Christ and have their sins forgiven, but they're not sealed. And that's why Matthew 24, 13, Jesus said, you have to endure to the end. Yes. Jesus's gospel there is a completely different gospel than anything Paul preached. <clears throat> Paul never preached you had to endure to the end. He said, we're, right. we're, we're, we're sealed by the Holy Spirit. So would, anyway, that be, would, would that be why there's... So would that be why there's some confusion over the virgins and the oil, a type of the Holy Spirit of Christ, and yet and, and not having a, something along those lines? It could be. I mean, uh, by all means, I mean, people will have uh, in First John 2, he, he talks about the, uh, the, the unction and this anointing of the Holy Spirit. It's fine for a believer to have the Holy Spirit, just like in the Old Testament. Some uh, of the saints had the Old Testament, but the difference is they weren't sealed unto the day of redemption. Right. There's okay. a big difference there. And, yeah. and that sealing of us being one with Jesus Christ, that's depicted in that marriage with Jesus Christ, the church being married to Christ, being one with Christ. The people after the rapture of the church that believe on Jesus after that, they're not one with Jesus Christ because they're not sealed. And uh -huh. consequently, they're never called the bride of Christ after that. Everybody that believes on Christ and, and becomes a Christian after the church's rapture uh, they're in the Bible. They're likened to servants. Um, they're uh -huh. likened to uh, sons, uh, or yeah, but they're not likened to a, a bride. Okay. So okay. anyway, um, what you have there is that people, the the great tribulation is coming, and at this time, you know, it says they're going to be preaching. The hundred forty four thousand are going to be going out and basically inviting people to a wedding. That's another big difference. Uh, when Jesus Christ returns, uh, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And that, and the rapture of the church is essentially the marriage of uh, the consummation of the marriage of the bride of Christ and Jesus Christ, where we become one with him, where we're, we're, we're one body. Um, our flesh is like his flesh. We're, we're changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Then up here, you're dealing, well, we're in heaven, dealing with uh, the marriage supper of the Lamb, the judgment seat of Christ. The 144,000 are commissioned to preach uh, to people and basically invite people to a wedding, not to be married to the right. bridegroom, but to attend a feast. Uh, it's all talked about through the book of Mark, Matthew, and Luke, this attendance, this invitation to a feast to meet the bridegroom, not to be married. And if they're watching, then they evidently can go up. But if they're not watching, they're left behind. And the punishment essentially is that, well, you missed your opportunity to get out. Now you have to go through the great tribulation. Uh -huh. So there is a conditional rapture, but it's not for the church. And so therefore we can reconcile a pre-tribulation rapture of believers where if you're saved, you're going up, thank God. And at the same time, these other passages that deal with a conditional situation, it's two different, it's two different raptures for two different groups of people. Right. And what that does is it gives you a very nice layout of three and a half, three and a half, three and a half, essentially, which is a total of ten and a half years. 
from a spring rapture to a fall advent, ten and a half years. Uh-huh. And what's interesting about that is in the book of Revelation, there's all these mentions of a third. A third of the trees are burnt up. A third of the right. moon is darkened. A third of the sun, a third of the moon turns to blood. A third of the moon is darkened. A third of the stars fall. A third of a third this, a third that. Third. Why? Why? Well, this uh, three, this the a third. All those things are representative of the great tribulation. And if three and a half years is a third, well, one third of ten and a half is is one third. So essentially, right. what you're dealing with is this time period is likened to a woman in travail, and you're dealing with a trimesters uh-huh. a woman who's in tri- travail, three and a half, three and a half, three and a half, separated by a conditional rapture, antichrist standing in the holy place, and then the return of Jesus Christ. Uh huh. So what you're actually doing is you're not actually even doing any damage to Pauline doctrine as far as the rapture of the church. You're actually in a in a in a strange way coming around and supporting that mm-hmm. by taking these other passages and putting them within their context of a of a second rapture. And the difference with what you're saying is, is that when, when you hear about the mid-trib rapture, that's based on a seven-year model. And, and on page 53, you stated there is no such thing as, quote, first three and a half years of the tribulation period, because there never was a seven-year tribulation period to start with. Daniel's, and that goes back to what we were talking about, Daniel chapter 9, that first three and a half years was Christ confirming, and then he was cut off, which which is interesting because Paul said in a very similar phrase, I would they were cut off that trouble you in Galatians. I wonder, I, I'll have to come back to that maybe at some point, that connection. But so so what you're doing is not undoing that, you're actually fleshing that out. So so those first seven years in your book, if I if I correctly understand that, if I was looking at it, when I'm looking at the first three years, that or seven years, that is what you call the beginning of sorrows. So when we're in Matthew chapter number 24, that beginning of sorrows is basically that time period. And then at that, the man of sin coming in, that is, that is more towards what you call Satan's advent. And I'm holding it up here. We'll see if I can get maybe Brother Kevin to take a picture and put it up. But here you have the picture of the time, the evening. Mm-hmm. Um, can you dive into that just a little bit? You've got the three hours, uh, you know, from six till till midnight and then from midnight till 6 a.m. And I wonder if you can just kind of overlay that on what you've got there on the board right now and talk to us about that for a minute. Yeah, absolutely. So, <clears throat> Jesus in his uh, parables in, in, in Mark chapter 13, he talks about, uh, it's a common verse that people use to talk about the rapture and that Jesus Christ could come back at any time. And they take Mark 13, 35, where he says, uh, watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh at even or at midnight or at the cock crowing or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say unto all watch. All right. So that watching goes along with this concept of somebody not being ready when he returns and being left behind. Um, that passage there in, in Mark, and also he repeats it in Matthew 24, Those nowhere in that context is he talking about the church, the, right. the body of Christ. That has absolutely nothing to do with the church. And these end times, uh, after the rapture of the church, he likens the end times from the rapture of the church to the second advent as... Uh, night time. And in the Jewish uh-huh. night time, there's what's called four watches to the night from six to nine o'clock, 6 p.m. Because uh, you remember the Jewish day goes from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Okay, so mm-hmm. that's the Jewish day. The Jewish night is 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. Now we don't have to take a lot of time to prove that, you know, the second advent is likened to the morning when Jesus returns, the uh, son of righteousness arising with healing in his wings. Uh, the second advent is likened to 6 a.m. And then the millennium when Jesus Christ is ruling and reigning is likened to a great and glorious day. Right. right? With the sunrise and beauty, beauty and everything. But this time is a time of darkness. And the rapture of the church, uh, we would put at 6 p.m., essentially the beginning of evening. And it's interesting that you can find a type of that in the marriage of Isaac with Rebecca. When Isaac, a type of Christ, marries Rebecca, a type of the church, uh, it specifically says in that passage that they met each other at evening. Okay, so 
what these little details in the Bible, they're, they're there for a reason. Uh -huh. And also another thing that's kind of peculiar about that story is that her, when Rebecca was asked by Elias or the servant to bring Rebecca back, her family was like, well, why don't you stick around here for a while? Why don't you stick around for 10 days? Yeah. Now, yeah. That, that shows up yeah. there. Why don't you stick around for 10 days church? And she says, okay. And so, and so maybe even in like Ephesians, I was just looking at Ephesians chapter five, where Paul says in verse eight, ye are, but now are ye light in the Lord. So if you took the Christians out, you, you are the body of Christ. You are in essence, turning the lights out on, on the world uh, in a sense, because you're, you're losing that, that connection there. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. Okay, so 6 PM, um, the lights go out. That's the rapture of the church. Jesus said, while you have the light, walk in the light, the lights go out, boom, and that starts the 6 p.m. Yeah, essentially in type. Uh, again, in this type. is in typology. I got it. Okay. Type, yeah. So the sun is going down. Uh, the light of the world is gone. The church is, is out. Uh, all, now all of a sudden you're left with 144,000 people that basically have to start over. You know, I mean, you go from the millions and millions of Christians in the world right now, born again Christians that are the light of this world, all of a sudden, boom, they're out. And now you're down to just 144,000 people on the planet going around preaching. Uh -huh. uh, it's going to start a time of great darkness, and it's only going to get darker and darker and darker. Um, what's interesting is there's a few passages where these watches are mentioned, and Jesus mentions it in Mark 13, 35, and he mentions all four watches. And he says, uh, you need to be paying attention. Bless coming suddenly, I find you sleeping, because they that sleep, sleep in the night. And so it's going to be very tempting, um, allegorically speaking, for for believers to fall asleep or to de delve into the wickedness of this world or basically just quit watching for Jesus, get discouraged, and basically uh, just give up. You know, and this is going to be a big problem, and that's the, the message of the book of Revelation. Don't take the mark of the beast. You know, uh -huh. endure to the end. Um, they're going to be this temptation to fall asleep, spiritually speaking. True. So he says, uh, you need to be watching. Then in Luke 12, 38, he gives a similar parable talking about the uh, the watches of the night. But he only he doesn't mention four watches. He only mentions less coming at the uh, uh, midnight or cock crowing. So he kind of went with four of them, evening, midnight, cock crowing, morning. And then in Luke, he whittles it down to his coming being... Uh, midnight or cock crowing and then in matthew 25 in the parable of the the virgins he whittles it down even more and he says that the 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 bridegroom came at midnight uh -huh. all right so that's why i put this uh the, the the this conditional rapture sometime in this midnight time period basically this time period between 12 or 9 p.m 12 a.m typologically speaking um and you if you divide 12 hours by 10 and a half years, you kind of get roughly three and a half to a four years is where this conditional rapture is. And they go out at midnight. And then what do you have? The following portion, when you start getting into the final three and a half years and the start of the great tribulation, this is the time of the cock crowing, which is interesting because this would also match the time when uh, Judas Iscariot showed up, uh, the son of perdition in the garden of Gethsemane to arrest Jesus Christ. And I apologize if I'm going really fast through this information. Nope. I know this is a lot to put together. That's why I recommend getting the book because Get it really book. breaks this Get down. The book. Buy the man's book. More. Yeah. But uh, there's a lot of information here. And, and what happens is when you, when you start to just at least allow, when you at least um, indulge the possibility of this theory, what, what I have found and what a lot of other people who have read the book have found is that this start, if, if you go with this template, or at least just give it a chance, you start to find that a lot of things in the Bible that you just couldn't ever place, didn't really seem to fit anywhere, start to make a whole lot of sense. And you start finding placements and, and a lot of, it's like a big puzzle. Prophecy is like a big puzzle. Uh huh. And when you have a, some pieces that are in the wrong spot, you can't go any farther until you remove those pieces and get them back in the right spot. Yes. So once you do, then all of a sudden, all these pieces you couldn't find a place for start fitting in very nicely. Well, one of the things that I, that, you know, I was just looking at while you were talking about that, Matthew 24, 14, that the concept of the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for witness, and then shall the end come. 
So that, that makes a lot more sense in that formula right there. And, and some of the old timers used to read, I can't think of the verses off the top of my head. It was almost like the more we get the gospel out and pray, the more we can urge the return of the Lord. It seems as if those kind of mentality that fits with that conditional rapture. I've also had a hard time with Pauline to some degree is making the rapture fit a timeline that is Jewish because it is a distinct part of the body of Christ. So, but when you, when you, so it doesn't have to follow that timeline, but when you look at it set up there, it does kind of unfold and, and make sense, especially when you start looking at some of the typologies of Isaac and Rebecca uh, and some of these other things like that. And it's very fascinating because again, it doesn't do any damage. I've often wondered, how do you get 144,000 guys trained up and ready to go and clear on their doctor and, and have them cut and run inside three and a half years? I've often wondered about that. Plus, you get the temple rebuilt. Plus, you get, you know, wh where do you fit a quote unquote possible World War III to kick things off? Then you, you fit the Antichrist coming into power. All of this thing gets has to be compacted into. Uh, and it's interesting because when you look at James, like I was just looking at this in light of James the other day, there's actually seems to be warnings of, of, of great prosperity, like you were talking about. There seems to be warnings of great prosperity. And our mentality is once the rapture happens, then boom, we launch out into this Katie bar the door, hell unleashed on earth. But with that seven year transition in there, or with that in there, it really could be one of those things where there is, you know, a global prosperity, a global kind of a thing, and there's time for all of this stuff to work. Whereas in, in James, they're actually, you know, in James 2, he's talking about, you know, don't get, don't, don't uh, be happy with a guy that's rich and wears gay clothing and that kind of thing. You need to, you, you can see that in there. So I just think it, when you lift that and put it back over the Bible, a lot of these dangling pieces that every honest, um, you know, prophecy student has to be honest about, those dangling pieces start to start to come back into focus, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And, and in the New Testament, that's the continual issue with the witnesses that are preaching the kingdom of heaven in the end times, in these parables that Jesus talks about, about people trying to gather people to join the marriage. Essentially, these people that are watching and are raptured out because they're watching for Jesus Christ, they're raptured out and they join in on the marriage feast up in heaven. And they've been invited by the 144,000 and maybe by any other evangelists. But the problem, the dilemma that the Bible continually talks about is that the people are not listening. Just mm -hmm. like in Jesus's day, when the apostles and Jesus preached, there was a lot of, they were rejected. Uh -huh. And the reason for the rejection that Jesus continually emphasizes over and over in the last days is that they're marrying and giving in marriage. You know, they, they can't come because I've just bought a field. I can't come because yep. I've just got married. I just, I can't come because I've got this. And it's like their riches and their complacent, their riches are causing a great complacency. Mm -hmm. Now, that's an interesting thing. If you, like you said, if, if the rapture happens and then the world is falling apart, you know, and just everything is going to pot because the church is gone. And um, why are they so complacent? Why is Israel seeming seemingly so prosperous? I mean, if the world was falling apart, you'd think they'd be like, yes, give it. This is the answer we're looking for. Right, right. But, but they're rejected. And so there's there's something going on there where there's a time of peace and prosperity. It seems like right after the rapture of the church, and I would even argue leading up to the rapture of the church, I believe the final days of the church are going to be a time of great prosperity. And that's going to bleed over into these end times. And because uh, again, 6 PM to 9 PM, you know, you still got some light metaphorically yes. speaking, you know, it's uh -huh. not too dark. It's not too bad. It's not until you start getting into the, real darkness of the 9 p.m. to 12 and then you start getting to the coldness the coldness uh -huh. of the night the, because of iniquity shall abound the love of many shall wax cold and so again you have all these these terminologies that just kind of fit with all of this and also and when you, know, you look at the when you look at that six to nine that twilight it, it's it's confusing it's not light 
it's not dark, it's somewhere in between, a yeah. very Laodicean sort of a kind of a feel to it. I've often thought about the Laodicean church, and I'm not, I'm not going to dive into what specific church, New Testament or, or, or tribulation, but the concept there has been, and, and I think I just finished reading Grady's book a couple, a month or so ago about Perilous Times. He speaks about that on the backside, that the church is dealing with something that is more deadly than persecution, and that is prosperity and, and the riches that we have. He talks about that in there. Uh, and so I find it to be a very fascinating thing when you think about it, and I think so too, as I see this unfolding. So real quick with the time that we have, and I, I'm going to plug this again. You guys got to get this. You, you, you got to get this. Uh, how, much, how much is this book? How much do you sell this book for, Brother Crane? Uh, I believe it's a uh... Fifteen ninety five on my website, finalfightbibleradio.com. Right, fifteen ninety five, and with a special soul trap code, you can get it for fifteen ninety five. It's worth every. <laughs> it's Love worth it. it. You got to get it. So, real quick on the cow, on the on the sketch there on the line, where do the two witnesses, Enoch, Elijah, Mo, uh, Moses, Elijah, where would you find them fitting in and that concept with that? Yeah, I'm glad you pointed that out because I wrote this thesis a number of years ago. I published it, I think, uh, three or four years ago. And at the time, there was still some things that I was trying to figure out myself, some details that I that I didn't quite know, I couldn't quite place. And so I just deferred to the general interpretation and included that in there. Moses and Elijah was one of those big ones that I could not place. Generally speaking, the general interpretation is that Moses and Elijah are the two witnesses of Revelation chapter 11, by all indications. Uh -huh. It doesn't say that specifically, but they probably right, right. Uh, They have a three and a half year ministry, and then they're killed by the beast, and then they lie in the streets for three and a half days dead, and then they, re they resurrect, and then they're raptured up to heaven. Most Bible commentators associate that ministry with the final three and a half years of the tribulation. They would put that over there, and that's kind of where I put it in my book. I'm mm -hmm. actually working on a second edition of the time of the end that hopefully will be out in a few months. And honestly, I'm going to uh, correct a lot of my grammatical issues that I had that first, <laughs> first one. Ugh, it's kind of rough, but uh, it's okay. The The content is still good. And, and so that Moses and Elijah thing, I'm going to fix in it and, and, a, and a couple other things, but um, the thesis still remains. So I would say this, where I have Moses and Elijah now, and I'm going to try to prove it in the second edition, is Moses and Elijah are this uh, second portion of the beginning of sorrows. So mm -hmm. essentially what the Lord did is he set up, and my marker is going bad, but the Lord set up the first three and a half years of the 144,000, and they are all present and accounted for in heaven according to Revelation chapter 7, I believe. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So they all make the conditional rapture. None of them are left behind. After they're gone... It's like the witness whittles down. Now for the second portion, Moses and Elijah are given three and a half years of this time to preach and do their miracles and things like that. And then the Antichrist will stand in the holy place and then be killed, evidently rise from the dead, get his deadly wound. And then he'll kill Moses and Elijah right around the beginning of the great tribulation. And then there will be the final. And then basically after Moses and Elijah, there isn't really a witness during these last three and a half years besides the plagues themselves and maybe and that angel that flies through the midst of heaven i was and just so, going to say would you say that revelation 14 uh would, that that angel would be sort of the last witness because yeah. at that point without getting too much into 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 the weeds that the gospel at that point the the gospel message there almost goes back to a Genesis type of one yeah. kind of a gospel. I mean, the most basic form you can get, fear God, give glory to him. I mean, that's yeah. that's fundamentally where you are with that. Okay, yeah. so let me ask you this then real quick. And I'm sitting here, I'm sitting here looking at this and I'm thinking about, okay, the, the, the timing of that and what you've got. So you've got him moving out there. Where would you fit? And I'm just I'm just spitballing here real quick. I'm yeah. not where would you fit the churches of Revel of the book of Revelation? Yes. Uh, so I would put the seven churches of Revelation as far as their doctrinal content. Really, they, they, they cover this whole entire period. Um, okay. Some of them, there's doctrinal content. That's, well, the church of Smyrna, he said, you shall have tribulation 10 days. Uh -huh. All right. Another type of the whole time period. There's some of them where he says, uh, because... Uh, you know, you need to watch. And it's almost like there's a, 
there's this conditional rapture thing. So I wouldn't lay them out, you know, very hard lines on this end time. But I think that there's doctrinal important information that will apply. You could basically, you could basically say there, there are seven types of believers in these end times. Um, some of them will be raptured. Some of them won't. Some will be killed. Some uh-huh. will endure from the from to the very end. Some will be some, uh, you know, all those different things. So, I think the the letters to the churches apply to believers in these times. The doctrinal content, because every single one of them talks about having to overcome. Uh-huh. You must overcome. He mentions that word with every single church. So every single believer, in one way, shape, or form, at this time, is going to have to overcome. Whether it's overcoming death, you know, to the death and their martyrdom, overcoming right. in the sense that they were watching for Jesus and obedient and got taken out or overcoming in the sense that they endured and didn't take the mark of the beast, all those things. Now, another question I have is, have you looked into the connection between the four watches of the night? Have you at all looked into the connection between the four watches of the night and the connection with the gospels, the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Uh, have you, have you looked at that at all and seen any kind of connection between, between those? I have not seen a connection there. There may very well be. I personally haven't recognized that. One thing I'll throw out there that I think is interesting is it appears that when the Antichrist rises from the dead, him and the Ten Kings burn Mystery Babylon. Uh-huh. And so Mystery Babylon isn't present for this final three and a half years of Great Tribulation. Right. And she's ty- typified by that prostitute in Proverbs chapter 7. And it says that she's lurking around in the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night, but she's not there in the morning. Uh-huh. And so it's almost like, yeah, Mystery Babylon coming into into focus right after the rapture of the church. And then she's there in the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night. It gives you three watches of the night. Boom, she's blown up here. And then she's not there for that final morning watch. So yes. you have another thing there. And I'll say this, um, I actually just published uh, The Time of the End 2, for what it's worth. It's available for pre-order on Final Fight Bible Radio, and I'll be shipping out copies here in the next uh, week or so. Okay. But, um, this uh, covers the, the prophecies of Daniel chapter 7 and those beasts. And this layout, basically it's opened up so many other things that now, I be- basically in this book I identify the, the four beasts of Revelation, and I show where they... Uh, or not Revelation, the four beasts of Daniel chapter 7. I show where they are on the, on the timeline, and again, it all just fits very, very okay. nice. So I'm interested. I'm going to have to get that book and read that. We'll have to come back and do an interview with that and then on Eden, because one of the things is we've confounded both Daniel's image and Daniel's beast oftentimes as one and the same, which I don't believe that they are. I believe that those are two distinct prophecies that are given. Now, <laughs> the question has been, my, my, my belief has been that those, those uh, beasts are future. But when you run up to the church, where does it go from there? The question has always been interesting to me because as a, as a dispensationalist, I believe that there is a unique parenthesis of the body of Christ, that doctrine and, and what it is. So Daniel is not per se prophesying about what happens during the body of Christ doctrine. He's prophesying about picking when Jesus comes, I think it's to some degree in the first advent, He's looking over it, as Larkin shows with that picture of the mountain. He's looking over it and then picking up and running out from there. So then oh, yes. then those, okay, so you know where I'm going with my question. I'll wait, read the book, we'll bring you back for that. Uh, so, okay, so I think in a nutshell, we, we hopefully wet the whistle of enough people to buy this book. I, if you love the Soul Trap, watch the Soul Trap at all, get this. If you're watching this and you're not, a, a Christian or a student of prophecy, I hope we have given you enough to begin to spark your thinking. This idea of walking around and you're drinking a cup of coffee and, and you're going getting out of here, it's not going to happen. The most important thing in all the world is that you're prepared to meet the Lord and that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. But I hope we've kind of sparked something in your heart that says, I need to look into this book. I need to study this word and find out. This is a great place to start. Final Fight Bible Radio is a great place to start. You need to make sure that you do that. Listen, we could talk more and more. I'm going to have to schedule with you and get you to come back because I think we've only scratched the surface of this. 
And I didn't want to get into it a whole lot, but I think that there is actually some connections I wanted to pick up between Eden, uh, Eden's fate, and this, and where we're going in the future. And now the second part coming out, I'm really excited about it. Brother Crane, you have done a good job. Anytime somebody excites me and thrills my heart about the Word of God, they are worth their weight in gold, and you have done that. So I think we have cleared the air that you are not a heretic. <laughs> <laughs> Number one, all, <right. laughs> all good, and uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna be honest with you. It, it biblically, it makes sense to me, and that's the most important thing. I see it there in the scripture. It's new, it's different, but I it, it's not new in the sense you're hatching it up. Like I said, it's like the rose. I think you're just putting more sunshine to it and letting it open up even more absolutely fantastic guys make sure you get his books make sure you are a supporter and involved in final fight bible radio and thank you for tuning in if you have questions don't email me email him good to see you guys we'll be back soon again watch one therefore for ye know not when the master of the house comes, at even, or at midnight, or at the cock crowing, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch.